We live in a world in which it seems like people can argue about anything. And sometimes it's good nature in this debate. Me and my son sometimes will go round and round about something that just totally doesn't matter. We enjoy it. But then we look around the world and look at other times people fight about everything. And even within the church, there is this danger of, of quarreling and disagreement leading to turmoil in God's, among God's people. The truth is, the danger of quarreling isn't new. I'm not sure we always consider how divisive the politics of Jesus' day were. Because, uh, you know, we think, well, Jesus and his disciples were all Jewish. They weren't the most diverse group. It would be easy to think that because they all lived in the same place at the same time. But yet... That's simply not true. The disciples were quite diverse. One of the disciples, <clears throat> he's referred to as Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. He belonged to a group of people who absolutely hated the Romans who were occupying their country. They hated the government that had imposed themselves on the Jewish people. And you know who they hated worse than the Romans? Anybody who cooperated with the Romans. They really didn't like Jewish people who cooperated with the Romans. People like Levi, or as we more commonly refer to him as Matthew, another one of Jesus' disciples, who was a tax collector and took his neighbor's money to give it to the Roman government. I can't imagine Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector spent a lot of time together without having some disagreements. Then there's another thing to consider. Among those 12 disciples, there were at least two and perhaps three sets of brothers. Brothers always get along, right? They wouldn't bicker. They wouldn't fight. They wouldn't have sibling rivalry, would they? Perhaps the only thing that united might have united uh, a set of brothers more quickly is um, having other brothers to compete against, to be in a rivalry against. And so you've got Peter and Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and some think that Thaddeus and James the last were brothers. Talk about sibling rivalry. Yet somehow Jesus called these guys together. And eventually they were, they were all united in one bond. The bond of Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. It's amazing to think that after the resurrection, Jesus kept appearing to these, to these men. And then he ascended into heaven, giving them the mission to go and make disciples of all the nations. He filled them with the Holy Spirit, and they did it. These disciples who were so different from one another were united by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they went and they changed the world. God changed the world through them. Think about it. When the church began, it was a small group, a relatively small group of people living in Judea. And within a very short time, it was thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people scattered across the, the known world. And what they started continues today. There's millions and millions and millions of people praise the name of Jesus now because of what God began with, 12, with a group of 12 probably fairly dysfunctional diverse men. 
And I shouldn't say this, men, because we have the twelve, but then there was a larger group of disciples, and there was a lot of women among them. Certainly, Easter time, we read about the, the Marys and the different women who were part of Jesus' ministry and there at the resurrection. We have something that can unite us. And so, this morning we're going to look at John chapter 17. It takes place the night before Jesus' crucifixion. It takes place in the night just prior to his arrest. It takes place as Jesus prays. Have you ever prayed about something that was really troubling you? We pray with passion, we pray with sincerity, we pray with a, a certain desperation. And so if we think about Jesus, who we follow, what was he praying about the night before his crucifixion? He prayed, he did pray for himself. He prayed that, that the Father's will would be done. He prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for you and I. He prayed for those who would come later. That's you and I. We don't have to guess at what Jesus prayed because it's recorded in John 17. Let's, uh, let's take a look at that. John 17. When Jesus finished saying these things, he looked up to heaven. And he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son can glorify you. You gave him authority over everyone so that he could give eternal life to everyone you gave him. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in the presence, in your presence, with the glory I shared with you before the world was created. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything you have given me comes from you. This is because I gave them the words that you gave me, and they received them. They truly understood that I came from you, and they believed that you have sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you gave me, because they are yours. Everything that is mine is yours, and everything that is yours is mine. I have been glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, even as I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Watch over them in your name, the name you gave me, that they will be one, just as we are one. When I was with them, I watched over them in your name, the name you gave to me. I kept them saved. None of them were lost, except for the one who was destined for destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you and I say these things while I'm in the world so that they can share completely in my joy. I gave your word to them and the world hated them because they don't belong to this world, just as I don't belong to this world. I'm not asking that you take them out of this world, but, you, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world just as I don't belong to this world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I made myself holy on their behalf so that they also would be made holy in truth. And this part's key. I'm not praying only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will also be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. I've given them glory, that, the glory that you gave me, so that they can be one, just as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me, so they will be made perfectly one. Then the world will know that you sent me 
and that you have loved them just as you love me. Father, I want those you gave me to be with me where I am. They can see my glory, which you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even the world didn't know you, but I've known you. And these believers know that you sent me. I've made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that your love for me will be in them and I myself will be in them. And those were the words of Jesus that he prayed to the Father before he was arrested. He prayed that he would be one. He prayed that those who believe because of the words of the disciples would be one. Well, that's you and I. We're part of this tradition passed down from Jesus to the disciples to then other disciples and other disciples and other disciples until somebody passed it on to you and I. We praise the Lord for that. Jesus is praying that we might be one. That just as he was one with the Father, just as he was in the Father and the Father was him, so he might be in us and so we might be one. It's, it's really quite beautiful when you think about it. But ultimately, when we ask the question, what did Jesus pray for that night? If you would sum it up in one word, he prayed for unity. He prayed for unity, that the believers might be one. He prayed that the disciples might be one just to see him, the Father were one. It's an interesting prayer if we remember that he had just left the Last Supper. That Last Supper was full of humanity. It was full of human beings being human beings. In, in Matthew 20, we read how, about how, about a week earlier, the mother of James and John, two of his disciples, came to him with her boys and begged him to let them set on each side of them when he, he became king. That's a pretty human thing to do. To come to Jesus and say, Lord, when you become king, may one of my sons be on your right and one of my sons be on your left. That's a pretty bold prayer. Now, of course, the other disciples overheard James and John's mom saying this. And of course, they weren't real happy. Why should they get to sit next, sit next to Jesus? So they became a bit angry. There's one more reason to bear. Then when it came to the Last Supper, the very night of his arrest, so the very night Jesus prayed this prayer, he sat down to a meal with Judas, who had betrayed him. He sat down to a meal with Peter, who was going to deny him three times. He sat down to a meal with the, with the other disciples, who would all abandon him after he was arrested. These men had followed him. They had different personalities. They had different occupations. They had different political views. And yet they were out about to undergo a time of great trial. To be in fear of their lives as they watched their leader haul away and beaten and crucified. In light of all this, it makes sense that that night Jesus prayed for unity. But here's the thing. He didn't just pray for their unity. He prayed for our unity. In John, uh, verse 17, 20, and 21, it says, Jesus, Jesus prays for us too. He says, I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one. Jesus prayed for our unity. So let's talk a little bit about unity. Well, this is a good time to talk about unity. You know why? Because we don't, we don't have any like ongoing conflict at the moment. That's what makes it a good time to talk about unity. You see, I don't know about you, but when I hear someone say they want to talk about unity, my first thought is, who needs to get in line? Who's arguing? How many times have we heard of somebody plead with a, plead with a group they're leading? to be unified as conflict seeks to split them apart. 
these discussions about unity rarely ever take place when they need to. And that's at a time outside of conflict. Typically, unity comes, the idea of unity comes up as this last-ditch effort to try to find peace among a group that's splintering. So without massive conflict, or let's talk a little bit about unity. I want to clarify something. It's important to know that when we're that we're discussing unity, not uniformity. We seek to be one in spirit and mind, not the same in other superficial ways. Unity is accepting differences, while uniformity seeks to eliminate differences. It's one of the struggles we have in our world today. Unity is about accepting differences. Uniformity is trying to eliminate them. We understand that God made each of us unique. We are uniquely different from one another. And that's something to celebrate. The, uh, the secular polling company Gallup, uh, years ago they, they developed this idea called strength findings. And it's a way of tracking um, common strengths that pop up among human beings. And there is only so many strengths that, in a very general way, that, that people have. And when you look at them, people are different. People are different, almost to the point where if you listed out every strength a person has, and you looked at the order that those strengths fall in, it's not quite like a fingerprint, but it makes people pretty unique. And God made us that way. And he did it that way for a reason. We are very different from one another. There are things that you can do that I can't. There are things that I can do that you can't. There are things that we both can do that somebody else can do a lot better than either one of us. Because we are different. And that's part of God's plan. We, uh, this summer, the Church of the Nazarene is having our general assembly. And it's, it's been a while since the last one. And the thing I look forward to most of all is simply to be among a group of Christians from all over the world who don't even speak the same language. And yet we can smile and nod as we pass each other because we know there is something that unites us. Despite how different we are, we're united by Jesus. And that makes everything amazing. Whether we're singing a worship song in a language I don't know, or whether we're sitting there together as the scripture is read and a pastor shares a message that's being translated into multiple languages so we can all understand. God created this unique. God created this diverse. God is the artist who created, created this mosaic of human beings that we're part of. He doesn't want us to all be uniform and to be cookie-cutter versions of one another. But he does want us to be united in our love for him and his love for us. So as we wrap our minds around those concepts, we begin to wonder, how do we achieve unity? Now, uniformity would be far easier. Like, if you, you go into a, a store or a restaurant, or, you know, people will often be wearing the same shirt or the same name tag or something that is uniform about everybody working there. You can make things uniform. But unity, unity is a little different because unity requires a change of heart. Unity requires a transformation of the mind. No wonder that even people of faith fall to uniformity instead of unity. To see the ways in which we could possibly be one in the midst of political divides and social divisions and family disputes and 
whatever the latest national crisis will be next week. Despite all that stuff, it seems like it would be almost impossible to figure out how we could achieve unity. But here's an idea. What if God's not calling us to pursue unity? Listen, listen to this program. What if the idea of pursuing unity isn't really biblical? What if that's not what Jesus is really getting at? In John 17, he prays for all believers in all future times, which would include us. He prays that, they, that all of them may be one. He certainly valued unity. He wanted our unity. He asked God to, to, uh, to give us unity. But what if the thing that is off is not our desire for unity, but the assumption that we're supposed to pursue it? The word unity appears seven times in, in the uh, NIV translation of the scripture. Five of them appear in the New Testament, and then the other three times um, it appears at the heading of a section. Once unity is celebrated in Psalms, says how in Psalm 133, 1, it says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Three times we're asked to put forth effort to keep unity. In Ephesians 4, 3, it says make every effort to keep the unity. Uh, twice it talks about unity through God's power. Give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials have ordered. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And in John 17 that we've read, he says, I give them the glory that you gave me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the other three times unity is mentioned in the Bible, in Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul tells us that God made known, made known the mystery of Christ to bring unity to all things. And then later in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, he adds, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity and faith. And then in Colossians chapter 3, we are commanded to put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. So to, to kind of recap this a little bit, the Bible's teaching on unity, once unity is celebrated, three times we're taught that unity needs effort. Two of those times it says we need God's power, and three times we're told that unity is an outcome. So why in the midst of that teaching would we assume that unity is meant to be a goal? Not once are we told that unity is the goal. And of course, the moment we start talking about unity, we become acutely aware of all the things which we are not unified about. Scripture never tells us to pursue the goal of unity. Scripture teaches that unity is great and that it won't happen naturally, and that unity is the byproduct of something else. Some things... You don't get by pursuing them. Some things you get by pursuing something different. I think you'll find that you'll have a lot more success at, at having a at getting your body healthy by focusing on being healthy than you will by just focusing on things that you shouldn't do. For example, have you ever tried really hard to not eat? unhealthy food, maybe you swore off desserts or unhealthy carbs, or, and you told yourself that you're not going to eat anything unhealthy, and that all sounds well and good until the next thing you know you're thinking about pizza or french fries or a blizzard or Dairy Queen, and suddenly it seems that's all you can think about is the unhealthy stuff. If you put your focus on not eating unhealthy food, you'll find you'll think about unhealthy food. However, if you put your focus on eating healthy food 
If you put your focus on exercise, if you put your focus on enjoying some sunshine, you'll find that avoiding the unhealthy stuff becomes a byproduct of you pursuing the healthy stuff. Similarly, if we if our pursuit is unity, we'll find it elusive because unity was never meant to be the goal. It's the byproduct of an outcome. If we want unity, the question is, what must we pursue? If we're going to be a people united as one, what should we pursue? Jesus. Number one, we pursue Jesus. In Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, we're told, he made known to us the mystery of, of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times reach their fulfillment, fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So as we pursue Christ, we are unified. That makes sense, doesn't it? We don't pursue unity, we pursue Jesus. And by pursuing Jesus, that begins to unify us. If all of us are pursuing Jesus in the areas that are of eternal significance, that are of most importance, we will grow in unity. Because what we value will begin to look more like what Jesus valued. What we love will begin to look more like what Jesus loved. You know what Jesus loved? He loved people. He died for them. He rose from the grave so that they might have hope of eternal life. Our mutual pursuit of Jesus will bring us closer to him, and it will bring us closer to each other. The pursuit of Jesus will be a, a great revealer of whether we are becoming more unified or whether we're simply seeking to be to find some sense of uniformity. Galatians 3.28 tells us, There was neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here's the thing, those distinctions don't go away. They just no longer matter because of our identity in Christ and our intimacy with him becomes so significant. When he talked about, when Paul talked about there is neither slave nor free nor Jew nor Gentile nor male nor female, it's not saying that, that those things cease to be there. He's saying that they take a second, uh, they take a seat behind the fact that we are one in Christ. Those things still exist. We still all come from different, different nationalities, different heritages. There's still male and female. There's the poor and the rich. There are all kinds of things that we can separate ourselves into, and yet, Jesus trumps all of those things. Jesus unites us beyond the things that separate us. What this teaches is that you have more in common with the person who follows Jesus than someone who doesn't believe in you. Your fellow believer may be of a different generation or a different tax bracket or a different political party. Your fellow believer may even like the New York Yankees. Yet you're more unified with the person who follows Jesus and seems completely different than you than you are with someone who shares all the same uh, surface similarities and yet is distant from their Savior. We need to understand the strength of the bond we have with the believers around us. We pursue Jesus. Number two, we pursue serving together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, we're told, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. So in this passage, we find that 
We find unity within the works of service, the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Unity isn't found in thinking about it, talking about it, or even desiring it. Unity is found by working together in the common things that God has created us to do. The point of the work is to build up the body, to fulfill the great commission. This is the actual goal Jesus told us that we should pursue. When we push aside our personal agenda and we give ourselves to service and working together, powerful things are happening. For one, we gain an appreciation of the gifting of others. It's easy in our world today to assume that we don't need the people around us. And yet we do. The value of the individual the value of the individual has been lost if we continue to believe that we're fine on our own. But as we pursue God, what God has called us to, we realize we can't accomplish it on our own. We need the gifting of those around us in order to do it. And as we gain an appreciation for the gifting of others. The truth is that the church, meaning the body of Christ, meaning the people, not the building. The church was God's idea. And I think it's perhaps it's worse in our little corner of the world, but we're very individual people, individualistic people. I think Americans in particular, and perhaps Mainers even more in particular, we have this idea that we're all supposed to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we don't need anybody, we can stand on our own and we're going to be independent. And yet, and perhaps you can in some things, but it's not what God called us to do. He called us to be there for one another, to gather together with one another. The church was his idea. He hasn't gifted each one of us with every gift that we need. He's gifted, gifted each one of us with some gifts, and he's put around us people with the other gifts that we need. As we work together and gain an appreciation for one another, realizing that we are created to need the gifting of those around us. And when we see that, we begin to value one another as individuals. Valuing others is the prerequisite for knowing others. And so when we value those around us, we grow closer in community to those around us. Serving is a context in which we get to know one another and grow together. Relationships form easily and relationships form closer when we work together towards a common goal. Because of these things, uh, unity is a natural byproduct as we work together doing the things God has called us to. And the third thing we can pursue, we pursue Jesus, we pursue uh, working together, and we pursue virtue, we pursue Christ-likeness. In Colossians 3, 12 to 14, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and deeply loved, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Unity comes through love and through the virtues that bind them together. I don't know how to say this another way. But here's the thing. It's easier to be unified with people who it's easier to find unity with people who don't act like jerks. That's the bottom line. If we don't treat each other well, it's pretty hard to find unity. Well, our character should be formed and refined through our relationship with Jesus and our commitment to, the, to be servants in his kingdom it's helpful for us to be aware that Christian character must be pursued. 
The listing of virtues in Colossians was not meant to be exhaustive, but it was meant to give us some key categories for evaluating our character. It may be helpful to ask ourselves, in light of this verse, am I compassionate? Am I kind? Am I thinking of others or only myself? Am I gentle? Am I patient? Am I, do I bear with others and forgive them when necessary? Am I living the life of love for God and others that Christ Jesus called me to? We need to ask ourselves those questions. That's how we evaluate, am I growing in my relationship with Christ? Am I growing more like him? Am I reflecting his image? Are there any of those virtues that don't describe you? Because if that's the case, it makes it harder for people to be united in Christ with you. Because you look a little less like Jesus. Those things, those are qualities of Jesus, meaning they're qualities that as we walk with Jesus, we should also reflect. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience together. Don't do it simply because those are good things, even though they are good, because those are the words that describe who Jesus is. And most of all, put on love, pursue love. Love is the only thing that is able to hold each of these virtues in perfect balance. Love knows when to hold someone accountable and when to extend mercy. Love knows when to teach and when to forgive. Love knows when to, when to help someone out and when to bear with one another. What I believe you'll find when we pursue Jesus, when we pursue serving, when we pursue virtue, is that unity is the natural byproduct of these things. Unity doesn't come from focusing on unity. It comes from pursuing Jesus and his mission and his character. It's not about the church being united so that they can do the work of God. It's about doing the work of God so that the church can be united. Unity is not the prerequisite for the work, it's the outcome. We don't unify so that we can do what we're called to do. It's as we do the work that we become unified. And apparently this is a big deal to Jesus. The night before his crucifixion, this is what he was praying. Remember his prayer. I'm not only praying for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray there will be one, Father, just as you and just as you were in me and I am in you. I pray that they will also be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. So do the work that will result in what Jesus tells us will be evidence the world needs to believe in. Don't sit around thinking about how hard unity will be to achieve when we're so diverse, when we're so divided. Focus on Jesus, pursue Jesus, pursue his mission, pursue his character, and focus on him. And when we do, we just might find that oneness that he prayed for. We might find that it comes quite naturally, simply by pursuing him. Let's sing one last song as we close this one. Pursue Jesus. Pursue his mission and pursue his character. May the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.